everybody. We're Perfect. here today at Brick House Studios in Glendale, California. Thanks. Uh, props out to Tim Leahy. He produces all kinds of music, including the blues. We're going to be talking about the blues today with Phil Gates. Phil Gates is here with us, and we are representing AmeraBlues.com and MusicYouCanSee.com. You've been growing up, huh? I've been having a good time. I've been having a good time. Well, you know, we're talking about the blues today, and, and you, and I'd love to hear about, you know, when you were first really you know, touched by the blues, when you played the blues first, how it inspired you, if you can tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I started out uh, actually uh, at about eight playing clarinet and uh, found out I was never going to be Pete Fountain. So I moved to uh, violin uh, and then drums and then finally to guitar. And uh, How so, old were you then? Uh, I was probably a guitar, I think I was in fifth grade, fifth or sixth grade, something like that. So I've been playing a little bit and, you know, my mom, she would just, you know, she knew my attention was going to change all the time. So I just, she just rented them for me and said, when you finally decide what one it is, and then I'll go buy one, you know, right. kind of thing. So I finally got a guitar because uh, my brother played guitar, actually. So I was following him. And uh, I've just loved it. But I started with the blues. Uh, my brother, we used to listen to a lot of stuff from... Uh, the Fillmore days, and uh, you know, and so a lot of that kind of stuff was was really cool. A lot of the Hendrix and and actually a guy named Roy Buchanan was a big influence. He was a really great player, and I heard Hendrix actually talk about him on a radio program on a rebroadcast of uh, King Biscuit Flower Hour, and so I was like, man, I got to buy this cat. So Roy Buchanan led me to the rest of the blues scene. The Hendrix and actually went that way from rock to blues, you know, and so then I got hit to Albert King and. Freddie King and BB King and Shuggy Otis and and Johnny Winter and Buddy Guy and Howlin' Wolf and you know all the cats Muddy Waters and just the history of the blues Hubert Sumlin you know just all the cats and I really loved playing it in the way that it felt and it just resonated with me uh, but at the same time I was very interested in other stuff I had like a really musical household uh, my old man listened to jazz all the time so the first melody line that I can never remember actually knowing was Coltrane's Love Supreme. You know, and the first lyrics I ever could sing was Hit the Road Jack by Ray Charles. So, you know, so those kind of influences were around the house. And my sisters were kind of listening to Motown, so I had that whole bag in the house. My brother's doing the, the rock scene and, and uh, with Janis Joplin and Hendrix and everything. So yeah. all these influences are in the house. So I kind of learned not to be a hater of any kind of music kind of early on because there was so much cool stuff around. Right. So I got to steal little bits from each and decide what I liked and what I didn't like. So, you know, fast forward uh, a bunch of years and I ended up really liking hybriding of things. And the artists that I kind of liked to go to were, you know, like Dizzy Gillespie doing straight ahead jazz but going down to Cuba and picking up that influence and coming out with Cubop and doing that whole bag. Or uh, a Santana mixing pop and, and, and Latin music. You know, so I always it was like a hybrid kind of thing of stuff that I like, and uh, but also I always like the blues, but I always like the hybrid stuff. Okay, when did you have your first band? Oh, first band was uh, sixth grade. Sixth grade. Sixth grade, and what were yeah, the influences yeah. coming from the other? The other uh, it was all rock. It was yeah, all yeah. rock. Yeah, yeah, it was a band. It was called Static. <laughs> and that's exactly sixth grade? what it sounded did you like. Say sixth grade, yeah. did. I did, that just kind of hit me right now. Sixth yeah. grade, okay. Yeah. So, so and it was a little band, and, and it was fun. It was cute, but yeah. uh, but uh, really, I didn't have any actual, you know, working touring bands or anything like that until after I got out of the service and did the the tour with the military, and that was a lot of. That was Tell a lot us a little bit about that, the military touring and the band. The uh, I signed up for the uh, United States Air Force, and I went in, and my regular day gig was being a integrated avionics repair guy. So basically on F-15 fighter planes, all the radar stuff and all the stuff the pilot touches is what I was fixing. Not me personally, but a whole shop of us. And, uh, <laughs> but I, was I got a car really, outside. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's, but it was great training, and that was why I did it, actually, because you know I knew that learning electronics was going to pave the way in a huge way, and it really has. It set me up completely. So I, I got to give the military that much, as it really did teach me a ton of stuff. However, uh, I did my four years, and they had talent contests. And I had a band then that was playing around the uh, officers' club and the NCO club and stuff like that, mostly rock and a little bit of blues. Um, but the Air Force has a thing called Tops and Blue, 
And it's kind of like an American Idol or Star Search of the military. You play mm-hmm. against your base, and then you play against your region and against your command. And it's like the IBC. You actually compete. And, uh, and the winners of, they, ultimately, it's about 600 people com- going for 50 slots. You're competing against the entire Air Force. And they pick 25 people, and you do a stateside tour, and 25 people that do a world tour. And so I got selected as a guitarist for the world tour. So that was a lot of fun, you know, and you play military bases and everything, but I mean, it really taught me whether I wanted to be in the business or not, Mm -hmm. okay? You have uh, seven tons of gear, okay? We had 2,000 pounds in wardrobe alone, Wow. okay? 25 people in the cast, uh, 20 dancers plus lighting, sound, and and management, Um, and we toured, I was on the road for 373 days straight between two different tours, Um, and... uh, we're the roadies. There's no roadies. Yeah. So it taught me right then. And the last show that we did was actually the halftime of the Super Bowl, which was a lot of fun. Super Bowl. That sounds team. like major growing pains right there. Yeah. You were that like, was, cut your teeth on. Yeah. We got one day off in every 11 and, and you really had to do a lot of work and yeah. steps and the music. It was, you know, pop and, and it was interesting, but I came out of that going, this is what I want to do. Right. You know. So when you going from there to when I met you, I met you a few years mm-hmm. back, and you you've got a great blues band, the Phil Gates Band, mm-hmm. and where could you give me a quick little um, history of how that went down? The I had a band in two thousand. I put out a record called Party Time in two thousand that was kind of like a funk record, and I got a band together there. It was an eight piece band, and we had a lot of fun playing like the local place, BB Kings, and things like that. Um, ultimately, that happened. I did a couple other records. Um, but I started doing the blues thing about four years ago in earnest, and actually, I'm sorry, about six years ago, okay. and uh, and got the, a lot of the same guys from that original band, and we started doing the Friday night blues dinner cruises that I do, you know, which is a, a very cool thing. Um, Adam Marina Del Rey. Adam Marina Del Rey yeah, with one of cruises, so Great it's a lot cruise. of fun. Yeah, we, we're in our fifth year of doing that, so it's a really a lot of fun, but that really solidified the band. What the turning point was, was... Uh, Doing the IBC, mm-hmm. you know, we did the international blues competition, and we went, uh, we won locally. We went to Memphis. Uh, we won the Beale Street Blues Kings Award, which was very cool, um, and that got us a lot of, you know, press that mm-hmm. it's going to get you. Uh, I simultaneously released a record, hired a publicist, and that really just kind of put us on the map and and gave me a point to have a voice from. Right. You know, so that was a lot of cool things, and everything's been happening since. The record was on the Grammy ballot last year. This record, in the meantime, the new record is on the Grammy ballot for this year. So, you know, if you're a Grammy member, go <laughs> vote. Well, it sounds but, like you really understand um, the business side. Obviously, through your growing pains, you've learned that music is a business as well absolutely. as as um, fun, as well as a way to reach people. It's a lot of different things, yeah. and you seem to understand. Uh, where do you think you got that from? Is it from the military or from no, I did, the uh, business side? I had the business side I learned from, you know, the necessary day gig that you have to have for, you know, a time until you can make the music work for you. Um, I did marketing for some really large corporations and I took notes, okay. you know, and said if this works, if this marketing campaign or mentality works for this company, if I shrink it down to what business I'm doing, it's got to be, a, it's a good principle. I just need to downsize it. For instance... If uh, you watch TV now, people go, well, you know, I don't know if I should be on Facebook or not, okay? If you watch a commercial now from Coke or Pepsi or GM or Ford or whatever, you know, they don't even bother putting up the website anymore. They just put Facebook. Right. Now, these people have the resources to have millions of dollars thrown into research and marketing. They have whole marketing teams that have done all the math and homework, Mm -hmm. and they came up for their multi-billion dollar companies, just put the Facebook thing on there. Well, it's good enough for them. <laughs> no, <laughs> I agree. Tool. I agree. I think corporations <laughs> you know, do it's good for me. Have and if you ability. look at it from the business point, you go, "Well, yes. how do I, how do I take this good business principle and apply it to my business, which is the Phil Gates band and and the business of Phil Gates and the mm-hmm. entity of Phil Gates, and mm-hmm. how does that work?" Then I can apply some of these principles, and and it's kind of it's working. Now I know one time we were talking, and you had said to me that you know you kind of separate your schedule, your day, like this hour I'm going to do this. Is it is that a way that you help separate your business and your creative? Absolutely. So tell me a little yeah, bit about that. Yeah, because I have the discipline. Because you're always going to get interrupted during the day, no matter what job you have. Phone calls come in and stuff like that, right. but you still have your targets for the day. And with with music, it's so much more uh, fluid. Yeah. You know, so you're constantly doing marketing, you're constantly chasing bookings, you're constantly doing this and that. However, if I do my business as a clock and worry about uh, 
Japan and Europe first and then worry about the eastern United States and then come to the west coast and stuff like that. I can kind of map my day based on those clocks and then decide how I want to do my day. So if I start just doing rudiments and rehearsals and not being creative and just working on my hands and, mm -hmm. and, the, and the music, uh, just as far as, as just exercising, then I can get that done and then I can start working on marketing and then I can start working on creatives for the webs and things like that. And then usually by like midday, then I can actually start working on music. And right, music, and, yeah. and, then, and then yeah. as the day goes through, when it gets to being nighttime again, you know, back 11 or 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock in the morning when it's quiet, now I can work on creative for marketing right. because I don't need any music. I don't need, you know, I can just chop away. So, yeah, I segment my day so, to make it. And what productive. do you think the value? I, I see you at a lot of shows. I see mm -hmm. a lot of watching other people play. You support mm -hmm. all these other artists that yeah. are playing. And how important is that for you? It's really important. It's really good to be. Uh, it's great learning, you know, because I always I compare myself to other bands, and I go, you know, I mean, it's like you know, steal early, steal often, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. So, <laughs> so yeah. if I see something that's working for another band, you know, and I go, wow, that's really cool. Can I put that in my band? Or if it's a band, you know, I just want to go support the music, okay. you know, and go, you know, it, it would be cool if people went and supported the music, and that includes us musicians. Absolutely. And a lot of times we're booked on the weekends and we can't go to stuff. But it's so much fun when you don't, and you can go see a friend play, and you just see them having a great time, you know, because we usually only get to see each other at mutual events where we're like slam busy or something, you know, so it's like, if I can just sit back and watch Kelly's live for the night, and I'm just like.